Hey everybody, my name is Ryan Maxwell and this is Ryan Parr and we are two movement specialists here with Fluid Health and Fitness. It's our pleasure to bring to you a series called Design to Move on correcting imbalances around your gait cycle or running. We know that a lot of times people exhibit with movement impairments, global movement distortions that impact the way that they connect with the ground and because of which it can lead to all sorts of injury cycles at the ankle, knees, hips, back, you name it, but they don't consider the whole body as a, as a collaborative whole and how certain muscle group imbalances around the upper body and trunk can actually lead to distortion in the hips. So today we're going to show you through a whole training protocol how to rebalance the relationships on the upper body so that we can avoid some of these major issues. To do that you are going to need a foam roller. We have a foam roller here, we have a lacrosse ball, Fluid has their own little fascia release ball, it's a hollow core rep ball, and then an exercise band that has about three to five pounds of tension. If you have questions, you can reach out to us directly at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com. But today we want to talk about what, Ryan? Really, we want to make sure that there's some context for these guys. So what's the issue in the upper body that leads to these distortions down below? The main issue in the upper body that we see is uh, known as upper cross syndrome. So it's where the shoulders come forward and then you get an extension out of the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see a hip hike in one side that tends to bring that hip up in the air and directly affect gait when you're running to, to so, work. But what's the deal? So why is there a hip hike? Why is the, the upper body impact the hip hike? Sorry to cut you off. Oh yeah, no yeah. worries. Um, this is the lat, right? Yeah, so the lat actually connects all the way in to the, well, yep, in front of the shoulder there, and then down into your hip. Back on the back side? Exactly. So if it's tight, it leads to the arching up? Yep. Okay. Yep, that along with the QL is another reason okay. um, that that happened, and that's one of the main stabilizers between the hips and the ribs. Got it. Okay, so we have connections in the upper body that attach basically the ribs to the arm, Yep. but also then attach the ribs through back into the back it can impact the height or the level of the pelvis. Exactly. So the pelvis is basically kind of like a, a scale, a counter lever, mm -hmm. right? And if the balance of the hips is off, it's probably going to impact your gait, huh? I would think so, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason why we want to talk about one side or the asymmetry of this is because the imbalance in the asymmetry is what leads to excess recruitment of certain muscles on one side of the body that can then distort the way that the joints move. Exactly. Right, so we're gonna do what, basically? Yeah, first we're gonna mobilize the tissues or the muscles that are holding you into this improper position, the ones that are bringing those shoulders forward and that hip up. And then after that, we're gonna recruit and try to activate the muscles that are gonna stabilize your hips and your ribs to keep them in a proper position. From there, we're gonna strengthen um, the muscles that hold your shoulders back, specifically the, the phasic or postural muscles in your back. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, we wanna look at your ability to maintain proper alignment of your pelvis while you're going through motions like gait. And from there, we're gonna tie it all in, um, so that way we can rewire your nervous system into a position that would actually be gate. very similar to gait. Yep. Yeah. That way, while your body is, I mean, while well, it's lined, right? Yeah. So we're realigning the body. Yeah. We're going to bring it through the motion that you want it to do. That way, it remembers it for the next time or for your run that's coming directly after this workout routine. Yeah. So remember, this is a tutorial video. It's serving as uh, basically a representation of what you want to go through. So we're going to be a little bit long winded because we want you to do it right. It may take a little bit of time out of the gates to understand the principles, but once we go through this, use the exercise selections, and you should be able to do this within about 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, definitely, yeah. once and you get the hang of it. Yeah, and this would be a movement prep exercise. So you could do this before you go run to align your body. So think of this as you know, bringing your body to a mechanic, and we're gonna wrench up the, the weak spots, like the phasic spots, the yep. sloppy ones, and then roll out and lengthen the muscles that are too tight so everything runs smoothly and your body purrs like, a, like an engine, right? Yep, yep, All right. exactly. On that note, let's take out the uh, overstretch muscles. We're going to show you how to use a technique called myofascial release and act release self-massage techniques with neuromuscular stretching so those muscles start to let go. Let's get right to it.
So the first muscle that's traditionally tight that pulls the arms forward is the pec major muscle. It attaches the sternum or the breastbone to the humerus and it draws the arm inward. A lot of times we overwork these muscles in the traditional training protocols that you see. So we're going to want to release that using one of our foam roll balls, the fluid ball. You can buy that on our website if you need one. So what we're going to do is get on the ground and lay down and Ryan's going to show you here how to get into position. He's going to come down on the floor lying prone and draw all his weight onto the ball, basically compressing the pec between his rib cage and the ball. He draws his arm out, abducting the arm to the side of the body, and he's going to lay his, basically his head onto his fist so he can support his forehead, and he's going to just maintain the pressure on that ball. You'll also notice that on the other side of the body, he's got his leg abducted and, and up into his hip, flexed up in the hip, and by doing that, it'll rotate through his pelvis and by extension through his spine so that there's enough pressure on the ball. It shouldn't be painful, and we're gonna wanna hold that position for about 30 to 60 seconds until the muscle releases or relaxes. It should be in the belly of the muscle where there's a nice tender spot. And then he's gonna start to roll his arm over his head or bring it over his head, breathing out and externally rotating so that the palm is up towards the ceiling at the top of the position. He's only gonna to go to the point where his arm starts to pull his shoulder out of alignment. So if the arm starts to internally rotate or shrug, if you're moving too far, the muscle's too tight and it's gonna distort the joint. We don't wanna compress those tissues, so we wanna only work within the range of motion that's appropriate. And you're gonna breathe out once again as you draw the arm up. And as you bring it back, you should notice that the resting tone or passive tone of the pec starts to soften and you'll be able to sink in a little bit deeper. You can do this for about 30 to 60 seconds or about six to 10 breathing cycles and then move on. To so the next muscle we're gonna target is the pec minor. Pec minor lays underneath the pec major, the muscle that we just targeted. And it's a, basically a triangular muscle that attaches from the caracoid process of the scapula down to the third through fifth rib. It's an internal and inferior rotator of the scapula, so it draws the shoulder inward and down. Again, it is one of those muscles that's pesky and leads to that upper cross syndrome, so we're gonna wanna target it. Reason why we did the pec major before the pec minor is we were able to soften the major to get underneath of it to get to the minor. That's why we're using a smaller ball, a lacrosse ball, to get into it. So you can do this against the wall or on the ground. Today we're gonna show you how to do it on the ground. So once again, place your body on the ball this time, instead of drawing the arm out to the side, you're gonna bring it back behind you, adjacent to the rib cage, and you're gonna lay your body weight into it. You may need to twist or open up, flare the opposite hemisphere up, so you may wanna rotate through the trunk just a little bit to get more pressure into the ball. Now, unlike the pec major, where you move the arm, you're gonna be moving through the scapula. So as we zoom in on Ryan, you're gonna notice that as he gets the muscle to relax, He's gonna start breathing out and pulling the shoulder back into posterior glide. So Ryan's gonna try his best to highlight here, and we'll try to zoom in and show you how to get into it. He's breathing out and retracting the shoulder back. Now remember, we're gonna to try to do this for 30 seconds before we start moving. So you wanna do a passive release on the muscle by applying the pressure from the ball onto the minor. Again, basically compressing it between the rib cage and the ball and then retract and draw the shoulder back. He's breathing out as he draws the shoulder. And one more time, don't do it so hard that the shoulder would start to shrug or elevate. We don't want to distort the joint that the muscle attaches to. Same protocol for this release. We'd want to breathe out for two to three times and then move on to the next area. This next muscle is pretty important, so we're going to go over this and understand the biomechanics um, and the attachment points. It's called the latissimus dorsi. It's probably one of the biggest, and in fact it is the biggest upper body muscle, and it attaches the arms and the trunk or the thorax, the rib cage, to the pelvis. It's incredibly important. It's part of the posterior oblique sling system, the superficial muscle groups that allow us to create propulsion. So when there's an asymmetry or too much tension on one side of the body, it leads to major disruptions down at the hips. So we're gonna show them real quick why this can actually impact your gait cycle. Know that the lat attaches basically under the armpit to the top of the humerus here, wraps under the arm, across the torso, and then down towards the lower back. Now this tension of that muscle when stretched will pull the rib cage internally. It'll actually protract or internally rotate. Now notice that as it comes across, his hip comes through with it. Now remember the body works in bipedal, right? 
bilateral relationships, almost like a helix, like a, like a, like a spiral, curricular linear. So if one muscle is too tight, you can see how where if I go through that position, it's gonna offset my hip and create too much internal rotation that can lead to too much momentum forces and into valgus as we swing through. Now, in opposition to that, on the opposite side, now remember, because they normally work in you know, opposite hemispheres, left, right hemispheres, normally if one is tight, one will be weak or phasic. So if it's not strong enough, it won't have an exert enough tension on its negative stretch to pull the hip around so that it can internally rotate and initiate the swing phase of gait so that we end up circumducting in the hip and that puts a lot of pressure into the hip flexor, the piriformis, and the lower back, obviously altering the gait cycle, the way that our foot can, gets in contact with the ground, and then ultimately impacting the ankle and the knee. Very important that we understand how to identify which one is tight, which one is weak. Traditionally, if you were to have an assessment with a movement specialist, they would look at the hip height. They would look at the ASIS, the hip bones in the front, the PSIS, the hip bones in the back, and look for too much downward drop or inferior drop in the hip and it would be hiked up on one side. If you don't have that, we would love to have you assess. We can do that here at our facility or you can do it online. We can actually watch you over the video and know that. So again, reach out to us at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com if you need more information and you want us to do that. We'll do it for free. We do it all day long. We love to help people get better. So just know that you would want to tackle the one side to release the overly top lat. So Ryan's going to highlight his right side today, and he's going to get down and show you how to do this. You're going to need a foam roller. Now you could use a foam roll ball, you could use a lacrosse ball, but it's pretty, pretty intense. Notice that he's going to offset the roller so that it lays behind his torso, so he's going to be just behind. Now remember, the lat sweeps down under the arm, it lays over the inferior aspect of the, of the scapula or the shoulder blade. So you can start to define where that muscle is by rolling over your rib cage, rolling back and just underneath the scapula. Roll till you feel a tender spot and then once you've found that, you're going to sit on that position. We use the roller because it has a wider surface area and out of the gates this might be the way to go because it's too much pressure. You're laying your whole body weight on top of that roller. So you want to start with a lower, you know, or a softer, more broad area, sorry right? Um, we get started. So also know that when the muscle flexes, it arches the back. So he's going to set up a neutral spinal alignment by bringing his knees up into his chest and staying in a, a fetal position. He's got a nice neutral spine, not too much rounding or hunching or too much arching, and he's just resting there. Now he can support his head with his opposite hand too, so he doesn't have to strain his neck. We'll make sure we feed into the central nervous system. And after he sat on the roller for about 30 to 60 seconds, he's gonna to start to articulate the joint that it attaches to at the humerus. Basically, I'm gonna move the arm. So he's gonna move the arm up, breathe out to flex his lats, or rather his abs, to oppose the stretch of the lat, so it anchors the spine, Make sure his palm is facing up at the top or supinated and then he's going to breathe in and let the arm come back down. So breathe out as the arm comes up overhead and breathe in as you come back. As you do this, every time you go through that movement cycle, you'll notice that the muscle should soften a little bit as you bring it back down. Now it might be tender, it might be sensitive, so don't go too hard too soon. There should never be any shaking, there should never be any pain. Should be some tenderness, but not excessive pain. How's that feel, right? Good. Good. So again, you would do this for about six breathing cycles after you've sat on it for about 30 seconds. You want to attack the dominant side, and then you would notice that the arm should have a noticeable increase in length or range of motion if you draw your arm overhead and feel less pressure along the lower back. The next muscle we're going to target is called the QL or the quadratus lumborum. And this is a suspension muscle that holds basically the spine and the ribs to the pelvis on the back side of the body. So Ryan, let's show them where, where we're identifying the muscle. Right down the spine where the transverse processes would come off from the vertebrae along the adjacent portion of the spine between the pelvis and the rib cage there, there's gonna be a little pocket there and inside just on the medial side uh, or rather the lateral side of the, the erectors is the QL. So if you put the ball there, you're going to feel a little tenderness and normally on the side that's tight, the hips can be hiked up. So really kind of exacerbate that. There you go. So you can see how his hip is hiked up a little bit. Well, that's what we're going to target and you're going to place the ball there. So Ryan, go ahead and get on the ground. This can be a sensitive muscle, so just be aware that 
You know, you may not want to go gangbusters right out of the gate when you first put that ball there. You can leverage your body weight in different ways so that you don't have to put as much pressure. But you'll notice that he's on his back. He's going to take his left knee and cross it over his right. By doing that, he's going to anchor his pelvis to make sure that it doesn't move around. Remember, the QL attaches to that boning marker and we don't want the bone to move. So by anchoring it, he's going to be able to stretch it once he's get the, or gotten the muscle to release. So he's starting with a static release, he's laying on the ball, and he's just going to use his breathing pattern to encourage that muscle to relax. We're going to do this again for about 30 to 60 seconds, just like the rest of the processes, and then we're going to start to move. Now to get the muscle to lengthen and pull under the length of the ball, he's going to breathe out, collapse his ribs downward into spinal flexion, thereby stretching the muscle, and then he's going to do a subtle contralateral tilt to the other side. This is a real easy self-massage technique using a lacrosse ball to help to get that muscle to relax. Now remember, this doesn't have a prime movement, meaning it's not a facilitator, it's not an action muscle, it's a stabilizer. So we want to be careful on it, we don't want to put too much pressure, we don't want to inflame it, and we don't want to go to it all the time. A lot of times where it feels good, kind of that, that good hurt, right, that scratch, scratch can't itch kind of thing, you spend too much time on it and then you piss it off. Don't do that. You want to go through the breathing pattern once again, two to three breathing, deep breath in, breathe out, crunch, laterally tilt to the side, and then back down, go through a couple of those, and then we'll move in to the next muscle group. So this is our next muscle called the TFL tensor fascia lata. It's one of the hip flexor muscles. It allows us to bring our hip into flexion. It abducts the leg out and externally rotates. Again, this is a traditionally overused muscle when we don't have enough gluteal strength or our pelvis is unstable and the way that our, our leg basically moves in the socket is distorted. So one of these guys is going to be tight either on one hemisphere or both, so we're going to show you how to do one, but you can tackle both. So to identify it, what you do is use your fingertips, your index finger and your middle finger, place them right under your hip bone, slide them down and back about an inch. You're going to lift your leg up abduct it out and then internally rotate it. But again, it's got to be under load so it can't be passive, meaning take it up off of gravity and you'll feel it bulge. When you feel that bulge, that's where you're going to put the ball in that little pocket between the trochanter hip bone and the pelvis bone. So that's where the ball is going and then Ryan's going to show you how to do it. So he's taking the lacrosse ball, placing it on that little pocket, laying laterally on his side, stabilizing his head by bracing his hand or his head on his hand and then taking the other leg and drawing it over the body. He's laying and putting his whole weight of his body on that guy. Now again, if it's tight, it might bark at you and it might try to guard and push back. So if you see that, don't put as much body weight onto the ball, kind of subside and lay off of it. One more time, we're holding it for 30 to 60 seconds to get that neuromuscular release. And then we wanna see if we can start to elongate the muscle fibers, get more extensibility out of the muscle by extending the leg back. So we're gonna draw the leg back and then if you can, if it's available, adduct the leg. You'll notice that if this is your first time doing this, it probably is not going to give you that range of motion. Ryan's been doing this for a long, long time, so he has nice, far reaching range of motion, so he's able to do that. If you notice that the muscle starts to quake or you start to flex back, the leg gets pushed down into the ground, these are compensations, your body's trying to guard too much, don't do it. One more time, we would breathe out as we go through the extension and the adduction making note that we stabilize our pelvis to anchor the hip as we draw that leg back. And the TFL uh, leads to snapping hip, pulls the hips open, can create too much rotation in the pelvis, all sorts of negative things associated with the gait pattern. Again, something that we're gonna wanna address to balance out our hips and our upper body. So there it is, TFL, stay after it, do both sides. This is our last one, guys. So rectus femoris, rectus upright femoris, femur. So it basically is the muscle that helps pull the leg up, erect, and it extends the knee. You guys who are runners, if you know anything about active relief or self-myofascial release or just stretching in general, you've probably done this stretch before. Rectus femoris is a dominant muscle in the body. It's one of the four quadricep muscles. It is the only of the four quadricep muscles that it flexes the hip as well. And because of which, it has a big impact on the hips and the leading of that anterior tilt and the hiking of the hip. Now, again, we talked about asymmetry in the hip line. Could be dominant on one side, but this is one of those muscles where you probably could stand doing it on both sides. Because again, quad dominance, forward dominance, pretty pervasive in all the, uh, the people that I've seen. How about you, Ryan? 
Yeah, definitely, especially for runners. Yeah, especially if you're, if you're using that. I mean, lots of knee extension flexion, right? Lots of hip flexion extension. So anyways, this is the go-to. We're gonna use our fascia release ball, the fluid fascia release ball. It's a nice rubber tack ball. That's why we like it. It's got a broader surface area than a lacrosse ball, but still smaller than a foam roller. So it gets into the nooks and crannies, but not too deep. We don't wanna laser in on there, okay? So he's gonna use that, and he's gonna put it right over his kneecap where the muscle attaches. He's gonna lay down prone on top of the ball, supporting his body weight, on his forearms and he's gonna take his other leg and bring it forward. And by doing that, it's gonna shift the weight onto that hemisphere that he's got or he's on. Uh, the ball's gonna be basically compressed uh, or compressing the rectus femoris muscle between the femur and the ball. And he's gonna sit there until he feels the muscle subside. Now again, he's gonna roll down towards the hip until he finds a tender spot or an adhesive spot or what we would call a trigger point. And this could be either a fascial bundle, it could be a spasm muscle, be a neuromuscular issue it could be a fascial issue we don't know necessarily but we do know that by applying pressure to the muscle for a significant amount of time it's going to help to reduce the tension in the fibers so that the muscle will want to lengthen it's called a neuromuscular release so oftentimes you'll see people doing this stretch where they kind of roll back and forth kind of violently that's not the application that we're looking for we're trying to apply it consistent pressure so that the fibers are kind of tugged on, it pulls into the tendon and could potentially lead to what's called a GTO response or Golgi tendon organ response. It's a sensory receptor in the connective tissues of the tendon that help to override the tension in the muscle fibers so that they start to lengthen and expand. If we do that long enough, the muscle will let go and then I can start to facilitate the stretch by bending or articulating to the knee where the, the rectus femoris attaches down at the patella. So he's gonna start to bend the knee and if you bend and you start to feel that little bump come up to the edge or apex of the ball, maybe that is it a little adhesive bundle. You don't want to let it roll underneath the ball, so only up to the apex of the ball. Come on down, breathe out, sink into that ball and see if you can get deeper into the muscle belly. Go through it again about four to six times, and then you're going to go to the other side. Again, can't, signif or can't emphasize this enough. You want to make sure to get the, the muscles of the rectus femoris and these big quad muscles under control. They have a huge impact on your mobility and your gait, so make sure to make this a go-to for the majority of your stretching protocol. Okie dokie. And that is it. Last, we got through all of the stretching, and now we're going to get into the activation drill, uh, or drills that are going to help to prepare the body to accept the strength protocols that we're going to put on it. So movement preparation or activation is basically getting the body to reestablish a better connection or a neural connection with the muscles that don't like to function. And one of the biggest issues or muscle groups that we want to work on are the uh, muscle complexes around breathing. Okay? We talked about it in the beginning, how the ribcage can lift up. We can get an arching in the back and a rounding in the shoulders. And that has to do with the ascension of the rib cage because we don't have enough abdominal pressure to hold it down. That can be because of the extra tension from the hip flexors, the TFL, the distortion patterns, or again, impairment syndromes that might be present. So this is an important thing for all of us to do. And we would see it manifest itself if we had a hyperascension, right? As a, an upward lifting of the ribs, it's all pursed up, right? That's not good for anybody, and it's not lining up our diaphragm so that it has a nice strong contraction. So we want to work on the doming of the rib cage downward by flexing. You can do that if you're laying on the ground by breathing all the air out of your lungs. And I mean, get all the air out of your lungs, right? Then you can feel your abs, right? That's the engagement of the transverse abdominis that's going to hold the rib cage down. Now, the hard part is maintaining that abdominal pressure not letting go of your abs and now trying to breathe in. When you do that, it's not gonna let you open up the ribs. It's gonna make you open up the backside of your ribs, and that's what we call it three-dimensional breathing. That excursion, or the expansion of the rib cage, acts as a little lever system that pulls the spine open and lets blood flow and circulation back to the discs of our vertebrae. It's actually pretty important because it's the primary way that we hydrate our discs of our thoracic spine. So if we don't have the capacity to do that, well, lots of issues, spondylosis, ankylosing spondylitis, degradation in the discs, right? herniation disc. We mentioned discs, right? We like to keep them safe, especially with all that packing or pounding that you guys, you runners, like to put on your spines, right? So again, this is a pretty important movement prep exercise to do before you get into any of the other activities that we're gonna show you. So again, I'm gonna stop talking here and show you how to get into the process. 
Draw your arms to the side of the torso so you can get into a neutral alignment. Palms are up, shoulders are retracted back, and your neck is tucked down so you give yourself a little double chin. Your heels are planted on the ground with your toes pointed up. We want to focus on this tibialis muscle. The toes are pulled up and in slightly. Plant it through the heels and pull your heels back so you feel some tension in the hamstrings. Again, focus on internal rotation. When you breathe in with your abdominals engaged, you're going to squeeze the roller get through those adductor muscles, and then breathe out, and try to breathe out to a count of four. At the bottom of the breath, there should be no more air left in your lungs, and you're gonna hold your breath for a second, not releasing, and then breathe in again, squeeze the roller, and go through the same process. It should be a one to four breathing pattern. So I'm breathing in for one, out four. Once again, always maintaining the pressure of the abdominals against that diaphragmic, or the diaphragm contraction. They work against each other. So learning how to co-contract the diaphragm and the abdominals together is how we engage your core, right? It's gonna to help to reduce the excess pressure around the muscles that are accessory respiratory muscles, so forced respiration when we're puffing and puffing. It's gonna to help to turn those down and that's gonna to help to realign the rib cage so that we don't have that excess of composis and we can get the natural range of motion that's appropriate for gait, okay? So Ryan would normally and you would normally do uh, maybe six to ten breathing cycles to start with. Remember, precision is key here. We don't want to do too much or too little. We want to do just enough to fatigue the systems and get those muscles to cooperate so that the central nervous system and all the other peripheral muscle systems cooperate the right way. Now that we've got the rib cage down where it belongs and the diaphragm and the abdominals cooperating, we want to get the arms to start to rotate around the rib cage the right way. It's called posterior and anterior glide. The arm will glide forward through the scapula around the rib cage, and then it will glide around the rib cage back posteriorly. So that's called horizontal adduction and abduction. So I'm adducting the scapula back, abducting it away from the spine. The arm comes along for the ride, right? So the goal here is to learn how to coordinate the scapular placement in relationship to the rhythm of my rib cage as I breathe. My rib cage is now under the control of my abdominals. Despite my breathing mechanics, I'm going to be able to make my arms work the right way. So we're trying to integrate this all by layering it in the order that we did with the 3D breathing first. Now again, if we have this internally rotated shoulder position, upper cross position, like we mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is going to go a long way to helping posteriorly glide and to press the shoulders down, keeping them in their natural flexed position or set position so we don't get as much pressure into the neck and by extension all the neck issues that come along with it as well. So Ryan's going to do that by getting into a four point position, this is called a serratus press, and we're going to ask you to do a couple things. This is all about the precision of the shoulder and the lumbopelvic system. He's going to maintain a natural arch of his lower back, his lumbar spine. He's going to breathe in and dome through his shoulders, expanding, same breathing pattern. He's upright now or inverted, so his abdominals are flexed, just like that 3D breathing pattern. And then he's going to shift his weight to his left arm. When he does that, he's going to push through the arm and get that extra little push-up plus gliding the scapula around the rib cage. What he's not going to do is push so hard that his rib cage rolls up and the pelvis starts to shift up. That's actually losing our kinetic chain. He's actually moving through the trunk and the spine and not isolating the muscles that protract the shoulder, which incidentally also pull it down and depress it. So we're gonna breathe in and reach, push through, keep the hips lined up so that they're parallel to the floor, breathe out, sink down into our shoulder. You could even put your arm back down, reset yourself. By breathing out, you're actively engaging your abdominals, and then breathe back in, lift up, dome, make sure there's as much air as you can in the lungs before you shift the weight, reach through the arm, and then breathe out and come back down. Good. So if it's too much loading, you can always do this on the wall, standing up. This is a progression from that. If it's not enough, you can always lift your heels up. But remember, if you choose to make it more intense, don't create compensations or distortions by shifting your weight or creating, again, misalignments. So again, if you start to see your hips shift over, if you start to round and rotate and flare open through the opposite hemisphere, these are all indicators that you're recruiting muscles that you don't want, and this is actually gonna reinforce negative patterns of movement. Make sure you don't do that. If you have questions on the specificity of this movement, because it is pretty articulate, right? Protraction, retraction around a rib cage that's doing the opposite. Again, we're coordinating the protraction and retraction of the scapula when we glide using the serratus. That can be complicated. Reach out to us. Again, take your questions at admin at
All right, awesome. So remember guys, you're gonna shoot for about two sets, anywhere from 15 to 20 repetitions. You won't feel it out of the gates. This is one of those weird ones, right, where it feels like nothing, but about a minute into it, that's when it starts to work, and you're like, oh boy, I can feel it. The shoulder will start to lift, it'll start to elevate and rotate upward and inward. That means your body's starting to compensate by trying to use your upper traps. You may not do it when you're pressing, but as you come back, it might glide up and rotate. The head might cant over to the side. If you see that, you're gonna stop. Work up to 20 reps. Okay. Now that we've set up the ribs, we've gotten the shoulders to come back and lay flat, we wanna integrate this into a full body global movement. This is gonna be a variation of a single leg balance, but there are a few nuances that we wanna work on. First, we wanna work on the mechanics of the foot. What people don't realize is that the foot is a pretty important stage of the basically the gait cycle. As we put our heel forward on the initial heel strike, there's a way that the foot falls in contact with the ground that's appropriate without leading to excess distortions of the kinetic chain to the knee and the hip. It should be heel strike on the outer lateral edge, roll almost along the outer lateral ridge, and then slowly flatten and come into inversion or flatten. It's called metatarsal spreading. If the arch of the foot isn't supported by the musculature, in this case the abductor hallucis, it can spread out too fast and lead to premature internal rotation or excessive internal rotation that pulls our whole body forward. Now remember we talked about how the hip could be hiked up. If the musculature from the upper body, from that upper cross, is creating that anterior glide, it means that the glute muscle is stretched, it's being extended, and that doesn't have the strength to hold the femur, which then controls the drop inward. So you can see how the relationship with the foot can lead to altered mechanics up at the pelvis. And again, the relationship with the upper cross issues leading to that distortion all the way down. That's why we wanna feed these systems together by recruiting the dome muscles around the foot, the glute, and again, the extensors of the scapula, and again, the abdominal pressure, putting it all together. So we want to basically coordinate these muscle firing patterns, right? Okay, so on that note, Ryan's going to show you an example of it. Hopefully you guys can get in on that foot. You can see the foot, but he's gripping the ground and he's pulling his toe back subtly to create a little bit more doming. You don't want to do this when you're in full gait. So the goal here is not to do this as a go-to posture while running. That can actually create more issues down the road. Right? But what we want to do is strengthen the muscles in isolation when we don't have other challenges like uneven ground, momentum, distractions while you're running, all that stuff. Get the muscles stronger in isolation so they have a stronger resting tone, means the rubber band's tighter so you don't have to think about it when you're running on it. Okay? So he's going to dome the foot, he's going to lift the opposite leg up, and he's going to use the glute to control the femur and he's gonna use his groin and his abdominals to lift the leg up as well as his hip flexors. Notice that he's coming all the way up to 90 degrees so he can get a deep flexion of that hip flexor and then he's locking his knee on the opposite leg, maintaining the doming. So this looks just like the ascension phase of gait. Remember that you're gonna get subtle internal rotation on the lead leg, subtle external rotation on the back leg through the hip, femur, and tibia. So we wanna practice that subtle internal rotation of that lead leg, lock the oblique, lock the knee out, create the doming, and flex the glute as you come up. Now he's gonna breathe out as he lifts the leg up, and he's gonna retract his shoulders at the same time. Abdominal pressure holds his rib cage down, he's pulling the shoulders around it, holding it for a second, and then slowly letting the weight come back down, and then letting the foot go. He's gonna work the foot, the tibial muscles, his gluteals, his obliques, his rhomboids, and his serratus, all these muscles are all coming to play, and these are all stabilizer muscles that help our gait affect themselves. So they look beautiful as you're walking. So customarily, if you have distortions, you can see different types of abnormal gaits or pathologic gaits. Hip will drop out, knee will valgus in, feet will ever it out. You'll see proximity in the knees as they strike each other when you're running. And this is gonna help to clean all those things up so that you can keep the pillars that are your legs directly underneath your pelvis so you don't get all that asymmetry. And again, because of that irregular movement, the distortion and breakdown of the joint centers, okay? So he did, oh, probably, how many did you do? About six to eight. Nice slow movements, right? He didn't just rush it, it wasn't just up and down. He brought it up, held it for a second, found his posture, found his balance, 
I can do the same, and then slowly came down and release the foot. If you're feeling in the arch of the foot, the tip, front of the shin, the glute, no bleats, you're doing it right. If not, you want some cues, again, reach out to us, okay? For you guys, two sets of 20. Once you have that down, remember maybe you're writing this stuff down or it's a long, or you're following the outline that we sent with the video. Either way, just make sure to get this in, in the order that we went in, and that's an important thing. Do these in order. They were written for that, that purpose so that everything lines up the way it should. Little issues around the singular joints acutely, and then we fed it into the kinetic chain. So make sure you're doing the same thing so you can get the most out of this application. All right, for the last one, Ryan and I are gonna be doing basically a step with a press. So in the body, there's always a cross reflex action going on. When one leg flexes, one extends. When one arm flexes, one extends. And they're superior inferior, or top to bottom, and left to right. So we want to coordinate this almost like you're wringing a rag out through your midsection. Right? The legs will rotate in towards the center as the torso rotates into the center on the opposite hemisphere. And that action of ringing through the midsection to create, again, more stability around the pelvis is called the anterior oblique sling system. And this, again, is one of the major muscle groupings that all coordinate to help maintain the level and, and stability of our pelvis in relationships to our appendage movement. A major takeaway, hopefully, from today is that your body works as a collective whole. The process that we're going through is a scientific one, and we want the body to work as it's supposed to with the right firing patterns that become your new normal, it becomes a reflex. If you do this enough, it actually helps to reestablish that motor programming in your brain for the motor cortex, so that this becomes your go-to. Now again, it doesn't have to be challenging, but it does have to be precise. So he's got a tiny little band, now Ryan played football, the guy's big, right? He's got lots of muscle mass. Could he do more than this two or three pound band? Yeah, I've seen the guy bench press a ton. But the point being, that's not the purpose of this exercise. So you guys out there who want to grab the big heavy bands, don't do it, okay? Work on the precision of the movement and make sure everything is accurate, okay? So what he's going to do is he's going to step forward into his lead leg on the right side. He's going to look at the symmetry of his hip. Is it flared open excessively? Is the knee flared open excessively? If it's opening up too much, we know that there might be some issues with the anterior tipping of the pelvis too much because he can't get the abdominals tight. There's a bony block at the acetabular and it's gliding his knee out. So we want to cinch up that abdominal wall, pull the ribs down, pelvis up. He's going to step his knee towards the center, just in the side of the midline, just about three degrees in from the acetabular. Make sure that the knee and ankle are tracking over each other. He's going to breathe in and push through the other arm. Looks a lot like that serratus press we did in isolation on the ground. And then he's going to breathe out. And as he comes out of the lunge and he steps back, he's controlling his abdominals and his rib cage by breathing out and flexing through his core, then gliding the arm and the leg back together. So he's going to do that again. Breathe out. Or I'm sorry, breathe in. I threw you guys off. Breathe in. Step forward, make sure you have the heel strike, the doming of the foot, just like that stability position. Breathe out as you come back. Breathe in as you step forward. Make sure that your torso is up over your hip. Hip, knee, and ankle are all stacked over each other. Protract through the shoulder. Retract, pull it back, and then step back into your beginning position. Now, as you get more comfortable with this and you can go further, go ahead and get more range of motion. Try your best not to lock the back leg out, though. So he's gonna keep that back knee bent, soft, so he doesn't have too much downward pressure from the hip flexor on the opposite leg. Breathe in deep, push through with a serratus press, rotate through the trunk, breathe out, come back down. Good job, bro. Okay, so this is an example of, again, what's called a contralateral reciprocation. Contra, opposite, lateral, opposite sides of the body, reciprocation, feeding together. We're trying to coordinate the nervous system so that both hemispheres of the body superior and inferior, and both hemispheres, left and right, are all coordinating together with the right joint symmetries and joint coupling and force coupling relationships. So what we don't want to do is add too much weight, too much speed, too much load, to the point of breaking down, okay? Again, for you guys, two sets of 20 repetitions, or until you fatigue, very little weight, 
slow, controlled time under tension. You saw how slow Ryan was going. Do the same for yourself. And one more time, if you have questions on the specifics, you can reach out to us at fluidhealthfitness.com. We had a lot of fun shooting this video with you guys today. I know there was a lot of information, really verbose, lots of, lots of information we threw at you. We hope you got something from it. Remember, specificity is key. The body works in global kinetic movement, meaning that we work through every single joint of the body and every movement that we do. Everything has a consequence, a push-pull combination. So if we learn how to uh, manage those systems in the right way, it can go a long way to preserving the joint health in our body and maintaining the, the things that we love. If we get to a point where we injure ourselves or we break, then we're out of the game. And so it does take a little bit of additional focus and practice so that we can maintain our body and continue to do these activities like running in our game. So one more time, guys. Reach us at our website at fluidhealthandfitness.com. You can reach out to us on our email at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com. We do movement assessments for everyone. You can do it virtually. You can do it in person here if you're in Stillwater. If you want to travel over to us in Stillwater, Minnesota. Either way, we'd love to get our hands on you and show you how to do it the right way. Remember, your body is designed to move, so stay in motion. So we will see you next time. And you guys have a good time. Keep running.